everyone. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. And I'm going to tell you a story today. You've come to hear about the case of the missing method. But before I get started, I've got a question for you. Do you have a side gig? You know, something that brings in a little extra each month. Well, I do. By day, I'm a product manager for a software team in a bank. But by night, I'm a private investigator. <laughs> and what is it I investigate? Ruby crimes. <laughs> Not dual theft, the programming language. And why did I decide to go into private investigating? Well, there's been rumors of a shady mastermind who's been causing havoc and confusion amongst Ruby developers worldwide with his constant meddling in the source code. <laughs> and I wanted to help put a stop to it. But I couldn't do this job under my normal name, right? I had to, I had to protect my identity. And so I chose the name Deirdre Bug, D for short. And, wh and why did I choose this name? Well, for the sole purpose of making this joke. <laughs> and today I'm going to tell you about one of my more memorable cases, the case of the missing method. Chapter one. So I was sitting alone, bored in my office. Well, I like to call it my office, but it's really just my flat. When the doorbell rings, and it's Mike, and he doesn't look too happy. Let me tell you about Mike. So he was an acquaintance of mine. We had some mutual friends. We saw each other now and again. He was 24 years old, a junior Ruby developer, and he got excited about test-driven development. And he'd been applying for an apprenticeship at the prestigious Ruby Institute of Professionals. And he'd managed to get through all of the stages, beating hundreds of applicants to the final stage. And it was happening in two days. And there were two people left fighting for this final spot, himself and a woman named Jenny. Let me tell you about Jenny. So she was 27 years old, also a junior Ruby developer, and she loved all things Rails. She's also Mike's best friend and housemate. They had quit their consulting jobs at the same time to enter into the world of tech, and not long after, they also decided to live together. And so for these interviews, they'd agreed to work together to prepare so that they each had the best shot. May the best person win, they'd said. And so for this interview, this final stage, they'd been asked to research a series of topics that they were going to be grilled on. And one of them was method lookup. And they'd assigned this topic to Jenny. And here was the reason that Mike had come to me. Something doesn't add up in Jenny's notes, he said. But Jenny's been so stressed and panicked, rather un uncharacteristically, that she won't hear me out, he said. She's convinced that she's right, and she's saying that we don't have time for my doubts. But you can help me find the answer to this mystery. And he says that then he'll have what he needs to confidently correct Jenny's notes and save them both from interview failure. So he reaches into his satchel and he draws out some sheets of paper. And they're Jenny's supposedly flawed notes. I asked him to walk me through them. So Jenny had these boxes to represent the concept of a Ruby object. And all of these objects had a label called class. And this acted as a reference to the parent class of the object in question. So some of these objects were instance objects. And the class label for these referred to another Ruby object of type class. Class objects also had their own class label. And all objects of type class also had a methods label. And this pointed to a table of all the methods that instances of that class could call. And then Jenny had written, any class you define is an instance of a class object called class. So if we were to write class cake in our code, we're creating a class object named cake. It's an instance of another class object 
and the name of that object is class. So all classes are of type class with a capital C. And then Jenny had this code in her notes. So it was class cake, and there were two methods. There was one instance method called tasty, which returned true if the flavor of the cake in question was carrot. So I immediately knew Jenny was smart, she was clever. <laughs> and then there was a class method called edible, which always returned true. Okay. Then she wrote, imagine we had a cake instance called carrot. So she had carrot equals cake.new. Then this is what the method lookup chain would look like. So she had one of her boxes and she'd labeled it carrot. It had a class label. It pointed to another one of the Ruby object boxes and it was called cake that had its own class label. It also had a methods label which pointed to a table and there was a single entry, the tasty method, because all instances of cake could call tasty. And then the class label for the cake object pointed to another object labeled class with a capital C. And it had a methods label and that pointed to a table also with a single entry called edible. And then Jenny had written, a method definition always comes from an object's class. And at this point, Mike shook his head with frustration. It cannot be that the edible method lives on the parent class for all classes, he said. Can I show you something here? Can I jump on your computer? I said, okay. So he goes over to my desk, opens up terminal, enters pry, and he loads in this cake class from Jenny's notes. So then he shows that the class of cake is indeed class, and then he searches all of the instance methods for edible in class. Nothing. What a mystery. I am stumped at this point, and I'm just not sure how to proceed with this one. But if anyone can tackle a challenge like this, it's D. And besides, this meant a lot to Mike. He was prepared to pay me handsomely. And so, I agreed to take on the case. Chapter two. Ever heard of Google? Or, if you care about your privacy or you don't like people on me spying on you, maybe you use DuckDuckGo. Well, when I'm D, I don't believe in these tools, no. I don't trust them. And it's no coincidence that with this approach, I've become the best Ruby PI the industry has to offer. And so what did I have? Books, 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 and more books. And I spent a whole day quickly skimming a load of books, but I couldn't find any useful information. So I thought, well, why don't I form a hypothesis and go from there? So I said, okay, the edible method, while not on the cake object, it must be somewhere in the ancestry tree. So what's the ancestry tree? Well, it shows all of the classes and modules that a class inherits from. So all, of, all the possible places that a method could come from when you call a method on an object. And I thought, well, how do I search this ancestry tree? So I made a method called where, and it took two parameters, an object and a method, and that's the method that you're trying to search for in relation to the object. And I looked through the ancestors of the object's class to try and find the class where the instance methods of that class and only that class included the method I was looking for. So I thought, let me just check that this method's working. So I created an instance of cake and I said, let me find the tasty method on this instance carrot. And if it's working, it should be on cake. Great. Now it's time to find the edible method. It has to be somewhere in the ancestry tree. What? Nowhere at all? <laughs> God, what a mystery. And at this point, I am confused. And I think, OK, it's time for some fresh air. It's time for a change of scenery. And so I decide to go to my favorite co-working space. And here I feel at home, because I'm surrounded by people hacking away and I quickly settled down at one desk. Given my naturally inquisitive nature, my eyes couldn't help but stray to the screen of the guy next to me. And he was playing around with this thing called object space and IRB. And I, I asked him, I said, what's that? That looks interesting. And he said, well, it's a way that you can interact with all of the live objects within a Ruby session. So if you were to type in 
object space dot count objects and pass in the symbol T class, you can count all of the live, live class objects that you have in a Ruby session. So I thought, okay, it's probably time for a break. Let me have a play by myself in IRB. So I went into IRB and I did what the guy had shown me. I counted up all the class objects. 936, so I thought, okay, let me create a class and see that that number goes up to 937. 938, what? Okay, let me try that again. Nine hundred and forty? What a mystery. Oh, but I don't have too much time to think about this because just, just then my phone rings and it's my friend wondering where I am. So you see, I'd completely forgotten that I'd agreed to go to this tech lecture with her and I was anxious that I really didn't have much time to solve Mike's case. But I'd been cancelling a lot on this friend lately, putting my investigative duties first. And I thought that maybe on this occasion, I should make a little bit of time for her. So I rushed out of the door. Chapter three. So I arrived just in time for the beginning of the lecture. And it was about a language called small talk. I wasn't interested at all. I mean, I only have space in my heart for Ruby. But as I said, I was there for my friends, so. And the lecturer was talking about how small talk had been born in the 1970s and it had led to the creation of object-oriented programming, but it wasn't long before I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't stop thinking about my play with object space. Each time I'd, be, I'd been creating one class, but yet two objects were being created. Psst, pay attention, my friend said. So I looked up to see the lecturer asking the room, what is the class of a class in small talk? And she had this code on the screen, and I hadn't been following, but I could see that she'd printed out this polygon object, and then she'd asked the system that she was interacting with, well, what's the class of the polygon object? And it had returned polygon class. And then she typed in polygon class class, and it printed out meta class. And she said, the class of a class in small talk is called a meta class. And then she went on to say that all languages that have been inspired by small talk have their own concept of meta classes. And that included Objective C, Java, Python, Ruby, Ruby. Oh, something clicked. One class, two objects. So I made my apologies to my soon to be no longer friend. And I rushed out of the door and ran home. And I thought, okay, let me try my luck. Okay, of course that was gonna to be too easy. So I said, well, let me look at all the methods that exist on cake. So I found this list rather overwhelming. So I thought, how can I filter it down? Let me look at all the methods that include the word class. Okay, so this list was a lot more manageable and two methods stuck out for me. One was superclass and the other one was singleton class. Okay, so I thought, well, let me remind myself of the ancestry tree for cake. And I said to myself, I know that the edible method already doesn't live on any of these classes or modules. So then I thought, well, let's see what superclass gives me. Object. So I immediately knew superclass was not what I was looking for. Object was in cake classes, ancestors. So that was time to try singleton class. Oh, this was new. I hadn't seen this before, it looked rather strange. And when I looked at the ancestry tree, I saw three new classes that I hadn't seen before that looked rather different. Very interesting. And so I thought, well, why don't I go back to my where method? And this time, rather than searching the ancestors of the object's class, why don't I search the ancestors of an object's singleton class so I could search through those three new things that I just discovered. And then it was time to give it a go. Moment of truth. There was that thing. And I thought, okay, let me just check that what I think is happening is actually happening. And in my excitement, I forgot how to type. But <laughs> I got there eventually and I confirmed 
that the edible method lived on Kate Singleton class. Case closed. Chapter four. So at this point, I am delighted. I'm so happy and I'm really excited to share this news with Mike. I also took a moment to wonder whether I should retire because this would prove to be one of the biggest successes of my career and they always say that you should quit when you're ahead. Anyway, I, I put the, pushed those thoughts aside and I picked up the phone and I gave Mike a call and the phone rings for forever and I'm, I'm about to lose hope at reaching him when he finally answers. And I, I say, hey, can I come round? I've solved the case. And he's excited. He says, of course, come round. I'll have the notes ready and waiting for you. But although the case was solved for Mike, I wasn't satisfied. Because I just discovered a whole new concept in the language that I hadn't heard of before. What are singleton classes? And so instead of going directly to Mike's, I took a detour to a friend of mine. She was called Ellen. She was 43 years old, a freelance developer, and she regularly contributed to the Ruby code base. So I proceeded to tell her all about the case. And when I'm done, I ask her, what are these singleton classes all about? And she says, well, they're hidden classes created internally behind the scenes in Ruby. And they're there to hold methods defined only for one particular object. So take your instance of carrot of the cake class. Its singleton class would hold methods specific to carrot only and not to any other instance, say if you had one called red velvet or chocolate. So I said, OK, given that they're working away behind the scenes, when does knowing about them become useful? So Ellen thought for a while. And then she told me about one of her recent clients. They were called Budgeting Inc. And they were a clever artificial intelligence, machine learning, personal finance tool for small business owners. And they were expanding globally. And they needed to roll out slightly unique versions of their software for each new city that they entered. Ellen told me how that when she first looked at the code base, she was horrified. Different developers had been responsible for each new city. And it looked like they were experimenting and trying out a new approach each time, whether it was naming things, testing things, designing interfaces. And so there was a lot of duplication in the code base. And sometimes that duplication was very obvious, like you could see it directly. And sometimes it wasn't so obvious, it was hidden beneath the surface. But this meant that there was a lot of wasted time on development because the developers were often reinventing the wheel, wheel and they were often doing a bad job of it. And so there were a lot of bugs. Some things had been copied hastily, some things had been left out, and it was really difficult to see what was important. So the developers at the company weren't unhappy. They had a lot of tiresome, repetitive work, and the cognitive load was really high. And the product owner was also unhappy because delivery was either very slow or things were spun up quickly and they were bug ridden. So Ellen wasn't quite sure what to do. And then she said, well, I decided to create a DSL, a domain-specific language. And she asked me if I knew what she was talking about. It's a mystery, Ellen. You're going to have to explain. So she said, well, let me show you what a basic version is. She beckoned me over to her computer. And she opened up Pry and she input this class. So it was called City Instance. It had a class method called Construct, which took a block. It then set up a city, a variable called city, which called out to initialize via the new keyword. Then we called instance eval on city, passing in the block that we passed into the construct method, and then we returned the city object. There was an attribute reader called taxes. We then had an initialize method, which set up an instance variable called taxes as an empty array. And then we had a method called tax, which took an argument called name and that pushed the name of that tax into the taxes collection. And now it was time to give it a go. So Ellen created a city instance called New York. And she added a couple of taxes. And then she printed out the taxes in New York. And so she said, there we have it. That is a very simple DSL. 
And now we can quickly keep spinning up these lightweight city objects. So imagine if we had other properties though, like a list of banks in a city or finance schemes. And imagine if we had more information on each of these properties. So maybe with the taxes, rather than just the name, we had some information about the threshold or the different rates. So using this simple framework as a starting point, it's not hard to extend the city instance class to create incrementally more complex city objects. Well, imagine taking this to the next level. Imagine interacting with the city instance class in the same way on the command line, but instead of just creating variables in our price session, we're spinning up new subclasses of city and other related models for each tax, scheme, bank that we list. So Ellen explains that this was the sort of thing that she had created for Budgeting Inc. A DSL that allowed for quick, easy scaffolding of each new city subclass and any other related classes. So she said, okay, I've shown you how you spin up identical city instances that have different names and different taxes. But what about if we had one city that had a quirk? So she asked me to think of a place in the UK, and I suggested Bath, since that was the, case of my, that was the scene of my first ever case. So she said, okay, let's take Bath. And let's add a tax. And then she said, can you think of something that makes people in the UK really unhappy? <laughs> and she didn't like my suggestion. She thought it was a bit too controversial. So she said, well, let's focus on the fact that it rains all the time in the UK. And let's say the, the local government feels sorry for people, and so they clear all the taxes when it rains. Great. So we looked at Bath's taxes. And then it rains, so the government's like, we'll call a rainy day amnesty. And then we look at the taxes again, no afternoon tea tax. Now, remember our friends in New York, Ellen said. Well, they've heard about this rainy day amnesty and they want some as well. And so it rains in New York and the government tries to call one. But no undefined method of rainy day amnesty for city instance. And then there were these interesting characters after it. And Ellen said, well, what are these interesting characters? Let me show you something. And I saw that when she called singleton class on New York, the exact same class object was returned. And so Ellen said, when we enter the realm of DSLs and we're calling methods like instance eval, what we're doing is we're leveraging the existence of singleton classes. Because what instance eval does is it stores any method declarations that we pass into the class via the block argument on an object singleton class. So hold on to that thought, said Ellen. I just want to take a step back to the high level for one second. So she says that by creating a DSL like this for Budgeting Inc., she enabled the developers to spin up each new city instance effortlessly. So she explains how she had like abstracted away the key similarities between any city. So now the developers had a frictionless way via the command line of spinning up the foundation that they needed. And the code was way better maintained because all of the scaffolding had been tested once and tested by Ellen. So now the developers didn't have to worry about it. They didn't have to touch it unless they changed that code. Instead, they could now focus on the interesting parts, the customization that was required for each new city. The scope was much more refined. So now the developers were happy because interacting with the system was a joy. It was easier to have a high-level overview of the whole domain purely just by looking at the documentation for the DSL. And the product owner was happy also because there were far fewer bugs, delivery was much faster, and she could also speak in the same language as the developers just by expressing new requirements in the terminology of the DSL. And now let's go back to singleton classes, said Ellen. So why is knowing about them useful? Well, one of the main reasons I was able to complete this project to a high standard, said Ellen, was because I understood exactly where I was defining methods at any given time. She said that once you enter the realm of dynamically creating classes and methods on singletons like we did, well, and as you saw in your investigation, the class hierarchy and method lookup gets far more interesting. And so you might be getting error messages and you need to be able to spot where singleton methods and classes are involved and where they're hiding, because it can save you from a lot of headache. But beware, Ellen said. I've been going on and on about DSLs, but they're not the answer to everything. If you have perhaps complex repeated business rules 
and maybe you need to customize behavior in specific instances, then you can consider DSLs as an option. But even then, approach with caution. But, she said, you don't even need to be writing DSLs for it to be beneficial for you to understand how they work. So she asked me, you're using Rails, right? You're using it every day. Well, then you're seeing DSLs every day. And she went to the Rails Guides website and she went to the active record migration section and she said, well, look, these are carried out via DSL. When you call create table and you specify what each of the columns are, that is a DSL. And she also said, when you specify how your Rails apps handle HTTP requests, that's also done via DSL. And I thought, hmm, I've always just been doing this by rote. I never stopped to think about what was happening behind the scenes every time I typed the resources keyword into my uh, roots RB file. And there's more of these, said Ellen. So she said that when people talk about Rails magic, it's not really Rails magic. It's more a collection of well-written DSLs. And then Ellen looked at me and she said, I hope you're TDDing all of the time. And I said, of course, Ellen, what do you take me for? And she said, good. Because our spec, with its describe context it blocks, that is all DSLs as well. And so with all of these Rails and R specs DSLs that you're using every day, knowing about singleton classes can help. Because you might find yourself in the midst of a tricky problem, and you can't make head or tail of it, particularly if you inherit a code base. And so if you're seeing a funny bug to do with methods, you never know. Singleton classes might be the answer. And having them as part of your suite of debugging tools can be incredibly useful. So I was feeling really leveled up by the end of this conversation. And armed with this new knowledge, I headed over to Mike's. But when I arrived, I found a Mike who had tears in his eyes. He'd obviously been recently crying. I looked down and I saw that he had crumpled pieces of paper in his hands. He raised his arms towards me, offering me the papers. They looked exactly the same as the method lookup notes of Jenny's that he brought me the day before. So I took the notes from him, I looked through them. I couldn't see what was wrong, they looked exactly the same. There was the carrot object with its class label. That pointed to a cake object that had its class label. It also had its methods label with tasty in there. And then the class object for cake pointed to the class object with its methods label, which also had the edible entry in there. But wait, it didn't say class like last time. This time, it said cake singleton. And as Mike saw me notice this difference, he fell to his knees and broke down in tears. Jenny knew about singleton classes all along He'd gone into her room to find the notes in advance of my arrival, and this was the copy of the notes he'd found. Jenny was so desperate to secure the job for herself that she set out to intentionally mislead Mike in the hope that he would fail a whole section of the interview and therefore look unprepared. I, for one, was disappointed in myself. I had, thank you. I had been, I know. I had been so focused on the main villain, the shady mastermind, that I'd failed to spot a villain right under my nose. My best friend tried to sabotage me, Mike cried. And at this point, he started wailing again, saying he wasn't going to go to the RIP interview tomorrow. And I said, nonsense, you cannot give up now. I crouched down next to him, I gave him a comforting pat on the shoulder, and I said, you can do this. And? I have just the thing to help set you apart from Jenny. And he looked up hopeful. Have you heard of DSLs? I asked him. And I proceeded to tell him everything that Ellen had just shared with me. And although Mike still looked devastated as I left him, I had confidence that I had inspired him with the power of singleton classes, that he'd pull himself together and go and secure the RIP internship for himself. So it's two months later, and I managed to drag myself out of the house to go to a hack night. And I'm just standing around, milling about, enjoying the free food and drink, when I hear a couple of people whispering in the corner. Ooh, she's really famous, one of them says. 
And I look across the room, and who do I see? Ellen. So I walk over, we catch up, and I tell her that I've been reflecting on the case of the missing method. I had my takeaways, so, you know, singleton classes, they're there to hold methods defined for one particular object. And understanding them opens up a whole new world of Ruby. Because when you're dynamically creating classes and methods on the fly in more complex applications with things like DSLs, then it's really useful to understand them. But I said to Ellen, I still feel as if day to day I can get by ignoring singleton classes. So do I really have to care about them at all? Not really said Ellen. Well, like you say, if, if you're writing DSLs, then, then definitely yes, know what you're doing. And they do underpin popular frameworks, like I showed you, like Rails. But day to day, you can get by ignoring them. However, she said, understanding why singleton classes are there, I think, is super interesting and empowering. Think of the Ruby core team. They wanted to keep things as straightforward and simple as possible. And by simple, what I mean is they wanted to minimize special cases. Can we aim for having one way, one pattern for explaining how anything works in the language? They asked themselves, how consistent can we get things? So let's think about consistency in the realm of Ruby methods. Well, if you think about it, all methods in Ruby are defined in only one of two places, a normal class object or a singleton class. And every method in Ruby is really an instance method. A method lookup always starts with a singleton class. And class methods don't really have any fundamentally different behavior to other methods. What we call class methods are really instance methods where the object in question is a class and the method is stored on the class's singleton. So yeah, singleton classes are invisible, but yet they're everywhere. They're a fundamental part to how Ruby and its method lookup works. So I left the hack night deep in thought. Ellen had inspired me to explore more of Ruby behind the scenes, because there was so much here that I didn't know. I'd only scratched the surface. And while I'd always been a general Ruby PI, and, and I'd been very successful in the field, I thought maybe it was time to find a niche so that I could reach that next level. 